Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm Stephen, your host for today, and I'm speaking with Professor Chong Liu from the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering. Professor Liu is the Neubauer Family Assistant Professor of Molecular Engineering, and her research focuses on material science, electrochemistry, water, energy, and separation with a focus on resource extraction from water systems. Before joining UChicago, she received her bachelor's degree from Fudan University in China and her PhD from Stanford, where she was also a postdoctoral researcher. Professor Liu is also a recipient of the Department of Energy's Early Career Research Program Award. She's here to talk to us today about her career path and how she became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Liu. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you. Glad to hear that. We're going to get into your biography, but first, could you just please describe for us in layman's terms what it is that you research and, and teach? I'm an assistant professor here at PME, Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. My research is related to materials. So we design different kinds of materials for applications in water and in energy. And in terms of teaching, and we, I teach thermodynamics. And for undergrad, that's a core course. So everyone has to learn that. And I also teach a analytic course, which is for graduate students, that's about molecular science and engineering of water. Okay, thank you. I look forward to hearing a little bit more about those topics. But first, can you just take us back and give us a sort of brief overview of your career, beginning in undergrad and up through now? Yeah, I had my undergrad in China, in Fudan University. My major in my undergrad is chemistry. So it's very common for a chemistry major to pursue research in undergrad. So after two years of research, I'm really interested in material science. So then I applied for a PhD program at the United States, and then I got admitted to Earth. And then I came here to the United States to do my PhD. And then afterwards, I did my postdoc at Stanford too, on material-related research. Okay. And just going back a little bit further, um, when you were maybe the equivalent of like uh, an American middle school or high school age, what were you interested in at that point? And was there any indication that you were going to end up in the field that you're in now? Oh, I think what, when I was a little, the general culture in China is that you have to get high education in terms of later you have a good job and a good quality of life. And so that is always the reason that everybody is working hard to try to maintain their academic excellence. I was just following the same track as everybody that we do. We try to work hard and get into good university. And at one time, I think I didn't realize that I'm going to pursue a academic career as a professor, but I always enjoy teaching, maybe just or like a thing called discussion of passing knowledge to my peers, even just in my classroom. So I, I do remember one new character of me is that I'm always interested in everything. I'm very curious about how things work. Mm -hmm. And even from a little that uh, I, when I go to the market, I saw people using the scale. And then I went home and I did one for myself, which <laughs> is just using boxes and lines. And then I, I made one. Yeah, I tried to <laughs> yeah mimic what they did. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, little foreshadowing there of, of your future career. Um, yeah. Can you tell me how you specifically got into the areas of research that you're in now? I'll have to be honest. I'm looking at your your profile here on the UChicago website. It mentions electrochemistry and yeah. energy and separation. I'm not really sure what these topics are and what they have to do with each other. So how did <laughs> how did you get into them? Well, you are quite right. So at the beginning, I decided to study chemistry. That's because I want some like a deeper understanding of how things work. So I choose a basic science as my major. So I was like considering between chemistry or physics, but I know that I like to do experiments. So then at the end, I chose chemistry as my major. And from that, you really enter you really like a get into the atomic molecular level of how things work. And that's very 
fascinating and interesting to me. And then after you had the background knowledge of basically how things work, and then you will have to create knowledge after your undergrad. So that's how, what we do in research. So we are trying to build upon what we know, and then we create new knowledge or new technologies and then pass to the next generation or like a contribute to the societal problems. That I have to think of something that's either the, is the principle is you either be the best of something or you be the first one of something. <laughs> so that's how I'm taught by my advisor, like how you can have a position or have a contributions to your own field. So then I choose something that people haven't really worked on a lot, which involves materials. That's my background. And electrochemistry also is my background, but I combine them together and we develop the new method for separation, which is really, I'm very excited about, and it's really working well. And the target is to address the critical element supply chain issue. Oh, okay. Interesting. I do want to hear more about that research, but I wanted to ask about who's been supporting you throughout your journey. You, you mentioned some lessons from your advisors there. And uh, yeah, just curious, who are some of the people who have been there for you? Definitely the first two would be my advisors. The first one is my PhD advisor. So he has a group of, when I was there, and he had a group of 40, 50 people. And we sometimes have seven or eight subgroups doing different things. So in that environment, you really got to learn that you don't know enough, right? So you have to be really deep in your own area. And at the same time, you heard other people talking about other things they are working on and you are not familiar with. So I think that environment really gave us a opportunity to have a broader knowledge. I think I, I would really thank my advisor to create such an environment that each of us can learn a lot, like maybe more than a small group can learn. Yeah. And he's always passionate about science and research, and he's a very energetic guy, and he like teaches us a lot. And you can think of a like he's managing 40, 50 people and everyone has to get a paper published every one or two years. So mm -hmm. his working load is really yeah. heavy. <laughs> so that really inspires us of looking at him and to know how hard we should work if we want to be in this field. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a lot of pressure for sure. And I I'm curious to hear from you. One thing that we try to ask about is just how people's international experiences have shaped their career. Obviously, you started abroad in China. So what was it like for you coming to the U.S.? And what were some of the challenges um, of getting to work on your PhD in that environment? Well, it's very different than China, I have to say. At the beginning, I didn't realize that we have a lot of homework, even as a graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I did all my work in my undergrad, and that's enough. But <laughs> because I'm switching to a different major and chemistry and material science actually are very different. So chemistry major and pursuing material science, we still like a lot of fundamental knowledge. So that's why we have to take 15 required courses. So that's really a lot for graduate students. Basically, mm -hmm. for PhD, you spend five, six years. And for the first two, three years, we have to take like maybe two courses per quarter. So that's really heavy load in study, not research work. I think that that do have some payoff. Yeah. yeah. So we learn a lot. So we have a like a more like stronger background knowledge of supporting us to do what we want to do. So that's very different. I thought I'm just going to come here and do research, but and now I have more <laughs> for the first two, one or two years, but that do trigger me to think more on my research and how I can apply all these new knowledges that I have learned to my own research. And the other thing is language, definitely. So we do have trainings in English in China, and we've learned that from 
middle school than elementary school. Uh, but still, that's not enough in terms of education in English because all the higher education we've done in China is still in Chinese. So the terminologies are not translated. So that's some barrier to me that I have to check by myself that to have understanding of the content. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious for a field that I'm sure has so many technical terms that one needs to know. What is the process like of coming from a completely different language with a different set of terms and having to learn those terms in English? Yeah, that's a difficult part. So you have to remember all those things by yourself. But if something is taught to you for the first time, then that's easier because you don't have a confusion about a translation in Chinese, then you don't have to find a correlation. Mm -hmm. But if the concept is already taught in Chinese, so the understanding of English sometimes is not exactly what I expect. So I have to do to eliminate the confusion that I caused by myself due to the translation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As you were finishing your PhD and looking at your next move, was there any question that you were going to continue in academia? Was that a concerted decision that, that you made at a certain point? Were there other options, other paths that you were thinking of following? Oh, actually, no. I'm enjoying very much the career that I picked. And now I'm still pretty fresh in my career. And this is my fifth year. So all I feel is still passion and energy that I try to do what I'm like a planned, where I have envisioned for. And still I see my group is growing. So that's still the uphill for the upper trajectory of my career. So I'm still very much enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to hear that. You touched on this earlier, but can you just describe a little bit about what your current research is and what is exciting to you about it? What is exciting in your field these days? Yeah. So we are excited, but what we are studying are really grand challenges. So, <laughs> so it's an opportunity, also a challenge to us. So in general, the background of what we are working on is to battle the climate change. So you have to think of many solutions to, to ultimately achieve the same goal of eliminate CO2 from the air or just mitigate the CO2 emission. One of that is to have a sustainable supply of raw materials for all the renewable technologies involved. For example, solar cells, wind turbines, and batteries and the large grade scale energy storage. So all those people are always thinking about how we can better make the device or how we can make whole choices of devices that, that we can use for the future. And then there's an underlying question that people haven't paid too much attention before, but now people realize that could be a bottleneck or a limiting step which is the raw material supply and the manufacturing capability. So if we want to build, for example, a lot of batteries for electric vehicles, we have to have a lot of lithium and transition metals to make those batteries. And currently, if we analyze the lithium distribution, mineable lithium sources, that wouldn't be enough to supply the manufacturing, the need from the manufacturing manufacturing aspect. Mm -hmm. So then we have to really think of new alternative resources that we can utilize for the manufacturing of raw lithium, as well as when we move on to these alternative resources, they get more and more diluted because people always start from the more concentrated one. So it's more profitable. And then now the challenge becomes we have to do lithium mining in more challenging environment and the current method wouldn't work as well. So that's where we come in. So we did uh, see, we did solve this problem early on. And so that's why, like uh, when I started, I directly jumped into this field and started to work on separation problems, especially for lithium. And we want to develop a method that can directly pull lithium out of unconventional water sources, for example, um, geothermal brines, uh, oil field blowback water, or even ultimately seawater, and there wouldn't be a limited supply issue. 
So if we can have a high selectivity, that's much better than the current technology can provide, then we can definitely solve this issue. So we just need to make this method better and better and economical. Yeah, so that's what we do. What we do is we design the material and we design a electrochemical platform to utilize this material. And this material can pull lithium into their crystal structure. And then we can design the crystal structure to have a great environment for lithium only, but not for the other type of ion so that only lithium comes in. So we can pull these out. Wow. So I mean, basically you're talking about um, building something that can extract a single element or, or compound. Yeah. Not sure the right term is, <laughs> but from, from water basically or from, yes. I mean, just, yeah. So, wow, that's, that's fascinating. And it's interesting how something on such a tiny molecular level could have such huge implications across the world for, like you said, uh, renewable energy. Exactly like you said. So the you can see the fundamental principle is on the atomic molecular level, and all the way we need to produce megaton, sorry, million tons of lithium for the world annually. So there's like an order of magnitude of difference in there. So we have to like a, work from the very small level all the way to a device level and scale them up. Yeah, that's really cool. What would your daily life be in a situation where you are working hands-on on that kind of thing? Yeah, so usually my student, each of them have their own project. They lead their own project. So the most important thing is the communication between me and the student as well as the student to his or her peer. We do weekly meetings or even within a week, we meet multiple times just to discuss the progress on the research. And we are always brainstorming together and then try to find the best solutions to if there's an emerging issue in the research or experiment, or we try to brainstorming about new ideas on this topic, what, like uh, what kind of other material that we use or how can we optimize the current material or the current uh, experiment setup. So other than that, the students are very independent. So they go into the lab and do their own research. We are typical wet chemistry lab and the students have to do the synthesis from the precursors. So they carry out the synthesis to the target material that we need and do all sort of characterization to know the morphology and the defect level and will be the thermodynamic properties of this material. And then we assemble the material into a electrode device and then test how they respond to the target ion that we are looking for. Yeah, so characterization is really a huge part to us. And we like to really understand how this material is working. So we have a lot of tools that can probe a nanoscale or atomic level um, information of the material that can help us to improve the material. Okay, that's some really interesting specifics. And I want to also just ask a kind of general <laughs> question um, yeah. about, about your current job. What would you say is the most fun aspect of what you do currently? And what would you say is the least fun? The most fun part, always the most exciting thing exciting moment to me is when we know how something works. So it's not to me like when the, my paper is published or like those are also exciting moments, but it's not comparable to when you really know, okay, this problem has been a puzzle to me for a long time. And now through all these studies, we really understand how this works and we can manipulate that. So that's the really exciting moment to me. Yeah. Okay. That's a great answer. What about uh, least fun? Like, <laughs> what is the, the <laughs> least enjoyable part? I don't think it's least fun. It's just that it's not very common to do a lot of jobs that you have role transitioning pretty frequently. So you have to have different thinking mode in a day. Like, oh, you, you will be a, a teacher and to prepare for the lectures. 
and you then it's a different knowledge. And then you have to do research with your student. And that's also a different type of thinking mode. And then you have all these services to the department or the university, and you have to do your own finance, which is more like a startup company that you are doing many roles in one. Mm. And it's fun, but sometimes the transitioning can cause some like a delay in how good I am in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah so I, I just to clarify, because I think that's, an interesting aspect of, of this kind of thing that people don't often think about. As someone who's in charge of your research group, you're in charge of making sure that it gets funded <laughs> and keeps running. Yes, yes. Yeah, is that, I would imagine that could be one of the more stressful aspects of this work, just because it's not really, I, I don't know, are, are you trained for that at all? How, how does someone learn how to do that? That's something new I learned after I started the job. So we don't get many experience about grant writing when we were, especially when we were graduate students, so seldom we, we would get to that. So when we were post on, maybe there are some times, but definitely not to the level when you are a independent researcher that you have to write several grants per year, and then you would hope for a good portion of that to be funded to make the group sustainable. So I, I have to learn through failure. <laughs> well, that's, I think that's a fun process because at the beginning, you really think you know a lot and then you are very excited about your idea, but then the proposal doesn't seem to be <laughs> what you expected. Yeah. And then you realize, okay, it's normal and maybe I have to deliver the message in a more understandable way. And then not only I know this is important and to try to assemble evidence to make other think that this is important. And at some point you are, you, you kind of getting better and better. Yeah. Yeah. What would your advice be for people who are interested in getting into molecular engineering and interested in pursuing it at a high level? Yes. So I do encourage students to think about still the engineering or the basic science aspect of research. I know computer science, AI, machine learning is a very hot topic. And uh, we are also trying to innovate the style of how we do research to be compatible with the big data and machine learning. But you cannot do machine learning without a fundamental knowledge to that field. So it's not a algorithm that can learn physics. You have to know physics or chemistry mm -hmm. to tell the computer what to do. So you cannot rely on a computer to send a rocket to the space. So you have to validate that. So in that, there, there, ha there is definitely a huge need for students to work on this area because we have to come together to find a solution for the climate change. There's not an algorithm that can learn physics. I think there, there's a lot of wisdom in that. That's a good, very good point and an important one for people to keep in mind. Um, I, and I think you, you said at the beginning that you are really excited and laser focused on what you're currently doing. If you want to just not answer this question, that's fine. But we've been asking people, are there questions that you hope to work on in the future? You know, are there other technologies that you'd like to work on or outstanding problems that you see yourself doing further down the road? Yeah. So that's always something like whenever I saw something out of my field and they seem very exciting and I read that from a, for example, just a journal article. And I was always wondering whether I can do something like that. So I think I do keep an open mind to different type of research, which doesn't seem very close to me. Maybe I cannot carry that out in my own group, but just by ourselves. But even we cannot do that in our own lab, but we can do those type of research through collaboration. When different people, like when people from different fields come to a, like a mutual interested topic and, and there could be fireworks. And it's a idea that, and that has never come to the field before. So those are the things I'm really looking forward to. I hope our expertise can bring some excitement to some biological research or other field not related to material science. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly see opportunities for those kinds of connections. Um, just to wrap up, 
if you can pinpoint it, what would you say is the most fulfilling thing about your job? Through my career, so one of my prioritized goal is to really train my students well and for them to be successful and to pass the spirit of research and the knowledge to the next generation of scientists or engineers. Um, that's the really, I put a lot of my effort in communicating with my students and really helping them to be a like a better researcher. And so that's one thing. And another thing is like, we are really excited that when we have something new come from our research and we think it could potentially be impactful to the field. So those two things are currently what I'm, I'm thinking are the fruitful moment for our, ourselves. Thank you, Professor Liu, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more. See you around.